Welcome, everyone. It's a great turnout. Thank you. So I feel like we have a dream team tonight, and, and I'm really thrilled to have both of our speakers. So this program has been a little while in uh, putting together, and uh, it took uh, the memory of Leonard Kaufman and all the experiences of his dad, and it took the smarts and writing of um, Harry Stein, and uh, to put them together uh, makes for a program that I don't think we'll be able to repeat in this topic anyway. So uh, I'm thrilled about tonight and glad that you could be with us. Um, and in an introduction of Harry, I'd like to start off by saying that I'd been a real admirer of Harry's writing before I actually met him. And in, in particular, I think his 1988 collaboration with Kim McCall, Merchants, Money, and Power, who's read that one, um, is a brilliant and important reevaluation, if not first realistic portrayal of Portland's early power block. And his biography of Gus Solomon, a Portland attorney who became Oregon's first Jewish federal judge, provided keen insight into Solomon but also of the city's Jewish community of the early to mid 20th century. And then when I was introduced to Harry, it was a great pleasure to find that he's a pleasant, generous, interesting guy to sit down and talk with. I first met him a few years ago while researching some Jewish and underworld, underworld characters tied in with the Crystal Hotel's history downtown. People Gus Solomon would have represented or known. Harry was kind enough to offer me some valuable sources, perspectives, and leads that proved very helpful for my work. When I approached Leonard Kaufman with the idea of doing this program about his dad's landmark gathering spot, I knew I also needed to convince Harry to give a contextual framework about the Jewish experience in Portland during the Depression and war years. And I'm truly grateful that he agreed. So a little bit about his background, uh, he got his MA and PhD degrees in history from the University of Minnesota. He taught history at Ithaca College, Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, and Penn State. He was visiting scholar at the Annenberg School of Communications at the University of Pennsylvania. Since 1979, Harry's been an independent scholar and historical consultant mainly for law, engineering, and business firms, including work as an expert witness. He's authored or co-authored several significant works, including the Gus Solomon biography I referred to earlier, uh, Old Growth, New Directions, 150 Years of Pope and Talbot, Merchants, Money, and Power, Muckraking, Past, Present, and Future, which he co-edited with John M. Harrison. Currently, Harry's immersed in writing the history of the Oregonian newspaper and recently, recently had an article on the subject published in the Oregon Historical Quarterly. Please help me welcome Harry Stein. back okay? Okay. Leonard Kaufman will be telling you about his father's Leonard's. It was a small downtown restaurant with an attached card room uh, admitting only uh, trusted patrons. Inside uh, people gambled with men, gambled with cards, and the house took a cut. So it was, uh, you had to go th th with a spy hole I understand and get into it. So uh, <coughs> So you say he, that part, he's on the edge of the rackets. Uh, during the, in, when he was in business, when he owned the place in the 1930s, Leonard's attracted uh, the sporting crowd. Uh, that included many Jewish men and a, a smattering of non-Jews who liked the food, which was good, and the company. 
In another downtown building, Leonard Sr. ran the Portland branch of Moe Annenberg's National Nationwide News Service. This was the famous racing wire. Uh, in 1930, the Justice Department estimated it provided more than 15,000 illegal bookmakers in the United States with almost a minute by minute information on horse races in the United States. By 1940, uh, Nationwide was the fifth largest customer of the American Telephone and Telegraph Company. Uh, between 1933 and 1936, Nationwide earned some $20 million from betting. Uh, Go, the government estimated. In wide open Portland, which, which was pretty much Portland into, well into the mid-50s, uh, the racing wire routinely, routinely paid off the cops uh, to avoid police raids. Uh, the police also came to the restaurant for free meals. Uh, Portland cops, like a lot of urban cops, expected to be fed on the cuff, it was called. Uh, my dad's restaurant did that so forth uh, in Texas. Uh, for decades, American cops expected to be, uh, expected to be uh, free, free, uh, fed freely. Uh, so well into the 50s, Portland is a wide open town brimming with gambling, bootlegging, prostitution, and civic corruption. Portland and other western cities also had Chinese tongs running opium and gambling dens. But in the 1930s, it lacked the uh, Jewish, Irish, and Italian criminal gangs that would be familiar to you from New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, Buffalo, Cleveland, and other places. Uh, Jews were in the rackets or in the edge of the rackets in Portland. That's usually not written about, let me tell you. Uh, they ran speakeasies, poorhouses, gambling dens, uh, excuse me, the, uh, excuse me the, uh, the gangs in Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, they ran speakeasies, whorehouses, gambling dens, the protection rackets, and uh, early uh, drug distribution. Portland in the 1930s did have uh, Jewish madams, Jewish pimps, Jewish fences, and until prohibition ended in 1933, Jewish speakeasy owners. Uh, some of these men showed up at Leonard's. Uh, so did Jewish attorneys and small business owners. Uh, the starving young lawyer, Gus Solomon, uh, played a mean poker hand, and uh, he liked the food and companionship of men he, who knew him and his family. He was a local boy. Uh, they knew one another from Old South Portland, uh, which was a predominantly East European Jewish immigrant area with a significant number of Italians, Italian immigrants also there. Uh, or they knew themselves from the t uh, each other from the Tony or Northeast periphery of uh, Old South Portland or from Portland Heights. Non-Jewish immigrant neighborhoods were scattered throughout Portland. Uh, many people don't know them. Uh, uh, they, were, they were Swedish neighborhoods, Norwegian neighborhoods, Croatian, Italian, Chinese. Uh, all of them were quite small. All occupied less than uh, half a mile square. So Portland lacked these teeming immigrant neighborhoods that would be familiar to you from uh, from the big cities of the East and Midwest. Uh, the ethnic neighborhoods of the country, including in Portland, had informal gathering places that were much like Leonard's. Uh, these included uh, uh, bars, which sometimes functioned as informal working men's clubs, social clubs, cafes, grocery stores, membership organizations, and card rooms. Leonard's was part of an old American tradition. Once every crossroads village and city in the United States had places where men informally gathered. Uh, stables, blacksmith shops, cafes, country stores, later car repair shops. Uh, you can still go in on some of the small towns, if you see, with the coffee cups lined up uh, over the counter with people's names on them. Uh, where you gather, and that's where the real business of the town gets decided upon. Those are the movers and shakers. So informal gathering places are around. Uh, so are the veterans clubs, uh, uh, where uh, many lodges and veterans clubs, uh, particularly because many of them had gambling. They supported themselves with gambling. Uh, so these were all around town in the 1950s in Portland. 
for Jews, there really were a lot of places to go, a lot of places to associate, uh, in Portland as elsewhere, uh, in, which included synagogues and plenty of non-synagogues. Uh, by one count, at least a thousand Jewish organizations existed in Portland between 1893 and 1940. Uh, so it was, a, uh, it was pretty hard to be isolated in the Jewish community. There were groups for about every taste, gender, uh, political view, uh, social function, and so forth. For immigrant Jews, uh, these, these uh, organizations uh, created a context that helped them remember the old country, to act out their Jewishness, and find ways through new American experiences. They nurtured a Jewish identity these Jewish organizations, and they still do. So for Jews in the 1930s, there were formal associations. I would imagine most of the Jewish men who gathered there belonged to, uh, businessmen probably belonged to B'nai B'rith. Uh, and there were uh, these informal gathering places like Leonard's. Uh, in in uh, 1930, there were about 11,000 uh, Portlanders who belonged to synagogues, and nobody counted those Jews who were not affiliated. Uh, while non-Jews lumped Jews all together, the Jewish community was far from homogenous uh, in Portland or any other urban place. Uh, there were differences, economic, political, cultural, religious, gender, among Jews reflected in these thousand plus Portland Jewish organizations. Unusually for Portland, compared to uh, the larger cities of the east and Midwest, um, there weren't the kind of racking conflicts between the East European Jews and the Jews who had come from the German states uh, or from uh, the Mediterranean area. Um, the, it was, uh, I don't know if uh, there's Portland exceptionalism here, but the historians so far have not been able, they, they, what they have emphasized was uh, that many prominent German Jews who had arrived earlier uh, and were in politics, business, and so forth, uh, sympathized with the East European immigrant Jews who were arriving in 1890s, 1900, 1910s, and uh, helped these uh, newcomers in many ways. Solomon, among others, who was from East European, his parents were born abroad, uh, developed very close uh, lifelong friends with uh, boys and then young men who came from uh, German Jewish homes. In any, in any, in any, excuse me, in any event, none of the Jews coming to Leonard's in the 1930s was welcome in private clubs in Portland, even if they could afford it. Not in Portland's country clubs, athletic clubs, or downtown clubs. Anti-Semitism in depth and breadth existed in this city as well as across the country in unconscious and institutionalized forms. It was accept anti-Semitism was an accepted feature of American life. Vaudeville acts caricatured Abies, Ikes, and uh, A.B. Kabibbles, Christian-only ads filled employment columns. High schools in Portland and elsewhere informally banned uh, Jewish students from sports teams, social clubs, fraternities, and sororities. Uh, Jews were routinely barred from many jobs in the United States and places, and so only partially incorporated into the local and national economies. Gus Solomon entered law practice in 1929, which was a pretty horrible year to be a young lawyer in anywhere in the United States. He entered practice, uh, he said, quote, not because I wanted to, in solo practice, not because I wanted to, but because I couldn't get a job, unquote, in local Christian-only law firms. Uh, then the 30s, of course, was rich in anti-Semitic organizations and the rise of Nazi Germany. Um, at the beginning of, in 1933, um, scholars have identified five important anti-Semitic organizations. Between 1933 and 1940, um, 
that they identified 119 rapidly anti-Semitic organizations farming in the United States. Uh, in, the, in Oregon, uh, several hundred Oregonians filled silver shirt posts. In Portland, Eugene, Vernonia, and other rural communities. Their base of power in silver shirts was in, the, in rural America. Uh, the German-American Boone ran in Portland, uh, ran meetings and propagandized on the radio. Silver shirts and Boone speakers attracted crowds in Portland of between 250 and 700, it's estimated, for their speakers uh, until around 38 when places began refusing to rent them space. The Bundes left vicious flyers on streetcars and doorsteps and nailed them on Jewish-owned shops. So anti-Semitism was, was, was very alive in Portland. Uh, and of course, would be very much uh, alive in the conversation and the actions of the people who went to Leonard's. Jews were acutely uh, sensitive to, the anti to anti Semitism and its manifestations and disguises and deeply resented it. Uh, at Leonard's in the 1930s, you found men like uh, Solomon, who formed and became very active in uh, activist groups like the Anti Defamation League of B'nai B'rith the American Jewish Congress, and the American Jewish Committee. Uh, even more broadly, uh, Jews uh, everywhere organized uh, and struggled to protect and rescue European Jews threatened in Nazi Germany and trying to get them out. In places like Leonard's, they felt at home. Um, I think that's the end. <laughs> Keep it short and sweet. And After Leonard gives you the real lowdown, uh, he's got wonderful stories. Wonderful. Uh, and I think they're true. Uh, uh, there'll be questions, and we'll, we'll, we'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, welcome back. And thanks again to Harry for the introduction, overview. Um, so now uh, I'm real pleased to uh, introduce Leonard Kaufman. And uh, it was his father uh, that ran and operated the place downtown that meant so much to to uh, a lot of folks during the 30s and 40s, and we'll explain why in, in the presentation we're about to do. Um, it has been one of the pleasures of my life to get to know and work with Leonard. He's just a wonderful guy who's been incredibly generous with his time, recollections, photos, all of which have proved to be an amazing window for me into the important place called Leonard's and its namesake, his dad, also Leonard Coffin. I first got in touch with Leonard in 2010 for the same reason I had contacted Harry Stein, the research I was doing as part of the McMinniman's renovation of the Crystal Hotel downtown. I quickly realized Leonard is possessed of one of the most remarkable memories I have ever <laughs> encountered and over the course of nearly four years since, he's opened my eyes to a much broader, significant, fascinating slice of Portland history, Western history, and really U.S. history than I ever expected, illustrating, among other things, that Portland during the first half of the last century was certainly not the insular provincial place it's sometimes made out to be. Tonight he's going to focus on his dad's place on Southwest 6th and Oak. It was a wildly popular spot established by the elder Leonard, in large part to cater to Jewish men who were denied access to social and athletic uh, private clubs throughout the city. <coughs> Quickly though, Leonard's gained a regional if not national reputation as the place to come for all, Jew or Gentile, when in Portland. Ladies and gentlemen, Leonard Kaufman. <laughs> yeah, that is on. Okay, thank you. <coughs> I, I refer to Harry as a heavy 
of the horse, so <laughs> go with the rest. Yeah, I'll hold it up closer to my face. Anyway, I refer to Dr. Stein as the head of the horse, so we'll go from there. Yeah, there you go. Just hold it up closer. Okay. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so um, first of all, Leonard, let's just explain what this place was uh, that your dad started. Well, I, I guess I have to go back to my dad traveled extensively throughout the country. He worked for United Cigar, and he was also announcing sports at that time. You can't hear. It, sorry. I'll, do, I'll try to do better. Is that better? Yep. Okay. Now, since I stopped singing, I forgot how to hear. <laughs> I, uh, my dad traveled extensively, and as he went throughout the United States, he noticed that in every city he went to, Cleveland, Detroit, Chicago, there was always clubs he could go to. There was always places that Jewish men gathered, exchanged information, uh, maybe found a way to better their business, etc. And when he come back to Portland, unless you played golf at Twalton, you really had no place to go. You could belong to the Elks, or you could belong to the Moose, or one of the Lodges. But you really didn't know who you were sitting down with at the card game, and if you had a private conversation, it probably was going to be overheard. So that's what started him on this train. That he knew he had the idea. He knew what he wanted to do with the cigar store. I guess because he smoked 20 to 30 cigars a day, so that was his first premise. The, he began to talk with a gentleman named Arthur Leonard, who had been a boyhood friend and who was in the tobacco business. And that's how they really formed Leonard's. But in all truthfulness, my dad drove him crazy. And in about a year, Arthur Leonard went down the street and opened his own pipe shop. <laughs> and so it became Leonard Kaufman, and Arthur Leonard became Arthur Leonard. So in truth, it, is, it really isn't Leonard's anymore. But my dad, anyway, my dad kept traveling extensively. He then became associated with Mo Annenberg from Philadelphia and Nationwide News Service. And my dad recreated sports events over the radio. For uh, also for the he was doing the racing for him as well. And he kept that job. Time that they opened Leonard's in 1930, Arthur at that time was still there and ran it. And the first thing they did that was probably the most important in the whole history. They took four booze out because my mother and her friends would come in and spend two hours at lunch and nobody else could eat. So with that they were able to put in two more tables and uh, the restaurant started to become a success. Why don't you tell the folks um, about the reputation that really went nationwide? I, I had a funny experience myself. I mean, it was really, really satisfying. I was on a plane going from Chicago to Denver to wanting to get to Portland. And a man, before we landed in Portland, said to me, you know, I, are you a Portlander? And I said, yes. He said, where's Leonard's? <laughs> so, so I thought it was a rib. You know, I looked behind me on the plane when somebody was sitting there. He said, that was the first thing they told me in Chicago. When you get to the Benson, look catty corner. And that's Leonard's, and that's where you want to eat. So, it was kind of a nice thing. And I, we're, we were, we've been sitting laughing about John Wayne. My dad had a World War I friend who ran, or I guess he owned the Willard Hotel in Klamath Falls. And he called my dad one day and he said, Leonard, you've got to come down here. He said, what do you mean? He said, John Wayne and Ward Bond and John Ford, they're tearing up the Willard. I don't know what to do about it. He said, it isn't money, they're throwing money all over the place, but i got to stop. So my dad got in the car with a gentleman named Marky Mayer, and they headed down to Klamath Wall was probably, I don't know how long it took them, a week or two, but anyway, it made it in time. <laughs> and they were able to settle it, and John Wayne told him, he said, how much money do I have to leave here if we have three or four more fights before we're done? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Dad settled it, came back to Portland, and about two weeks later, John Wayne came in the store, and he said, I need your help, I've got a girl across the street in the Benson, and I'm not sure what I have to do. <laughs> So anyway, he almost became a movie impresario. So the Duke made it into the store. Duke made it into the store and liked the food. Um, so let's talk about uh, the neighborhood too. What what Leonard's was where? Where downtown? On Sixth Street between Oak and uh, Broadway. 
uh, Wright County, just a few doors from Western Union, which many of his uh, gambling friends use constantly. The banks were downtown, the wholesalers, the clothiers. Anybody who really had to do anything at that time, the east side was a wonderful place to live, but there was not much going on in the business community. So everything was centered downtown, and that's another reason Dad could pick that spot in 6 and Oak. He wanted to be close to where the business people could come in, professionals. I, I think it always shocked me that how many doctors came in the store and ate or played cards or did. I thought every doctor just worked coping on here and Just worked a number of hours a day and then did his rounds. <laughs> All right, so here we have a layout of Leonard's. Um, and why don't we talk about that? What was in Leonard's? Well, the, the main, I guess if you can see, I don't know if my finger will work, but anyway, if there were nine, nine tables it shows, but there actually were two more that were in the front were kind of, it looks like a little cracker box or something. And that was, those were, they put tablecloths down on at least six or seven of the tables. And at noon, everything stopped in the card room, and all the judges, lawyers, whatever came in and started schmoozing, hollering at each other, needling, you know, anything but mayhem, not real mayhem. But uh, I, I can remember that every doctor was called doc, and if you were an attorney, they called you judge. And <laughs> when Lefty O'Doul came in, he was Lefty, and then the time Ralph Capone came in, he was Mr. Capone. <laughs> So you had the, the card room, which is at the top, um, and then uh, below in the main entrance was the lunch counter. It was a lunch counter that was in an L shape, and then with the whole wall, as you walked in the door to your left, were cigars. They were just humidors from floor to the ceiling with a little ladder so they could get up and reach them. And what else was on that counter line? The counter line, they also had candies, and that was a big thing then, box candies and, and of course, cigarettes. And then there was a, uh, the, well, the horse book came up much later. But in the, the early years, you know, there was, there, there was no book making, it was just strictly the card room in the back. Uh -huh. And then once the book came, then they took a little, took the cigars away and put the, where they had a man who could, place, you could place a bed. And the other end of the counter was? Uh, well, the kitchen and the dishwasher, and the, he had four, which is kind of unusual, he had four girls. They were really busy. The uh, one gal came in the morning, and it was just a light breakfast, and then uh, they served probably 100 to 150 people every day at lunch. Many who sat in the back, and the girls, of course, did that, uh, that business too, running. So they, and when one ended up in the evening, so it was, it was a busy place. Uh, Ed Sammons and his predecessors always had a table that they called to come if they wanted to come in and eat. And so there was a lot of business done in the, in the store. Ed Sammons was... Um, well, he became the president of a bank. He was in uh, with Iron Farm. Right. President Iron Farm. But they... Uh, people liked it. The food was good. That was the one thing when Arthur Leonard and my dad had a problem over. He was, Arthur Leonard was a very good businessman, and my dad was not, but he realized that he knew people, and that you didn't make money on your food. That's what brought people in. And so, uh, the food was a loser, lost leader, as they call it, I guess. Um, and what was this little space, right? <laughs> right there. My father was very fond of Al Winters. And so he had a little cubby hole that had been in the office that they didn't need because my dad wasn't a businessman, so it didn't matter anyway. We're looking right below the storage area in the upper right. There's a little closet-like space. So Al Winters had room for his hat and coat and a desk and a little chair. And so he used that for a lot of his uh, ventures, I guess. And a phone, right? And a phone. And that was a big thing at my dad's. My dad always had two phones that people could get calls or they could make calls. And I would, I, I like, I'd love to have listened in a lot of those calls. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, let's talk about some of the staff there over the years. Do you want to identify Al Winter? Uh, yeah, well, Al Winter, we're going to talk about him in a little while longer. Okay. But 
he was he became uh, the he had a lot of titles, but uh, the the vice lord, vice overlord, as they say, of Portland and much of Oregon and Southwest Washington. And um, later on, he would go take his um, his associates and relocate down to Las Vegas and open the Sahara. And uh, so he had lots of friends and lots of. Uh, deals going on, and he was a very good friend of Leonard's dad. Um, he, he, there's many stories of them coming together and, and uh, going on hunting trips, fishing trips, and doing some business deals, uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit. You and the other people? Yeah. Well, probably the most interesting character was Bill Kerrigan, whose father, if you go up in Portland Heights and you get near Ainsworth School and there's that great fire station there with a little house, that was the Kerrigan house. And he graduated from Stanford and really didn't want to work hard and went to work for my dad behind the cigar counter. <laughs> <laughs> and Harry White and Bill Hyatt probably was the most famous who went on to be one of the owners of the Sahara. That's a wonderful story in itself. He worked for my dad uh, when Al Winters went to the turf, he went over to work for him, and then he was drafted in the Army. And they took care of him. When he came out of the Army, here he was a cigar clerk. He, he was worth about $600,000. <laughs> and never had a worry again. They made him a partner. They made him a partner. Up front, really. Yeah. So it, there, there were four people working the cigar counter all the time, See, very busy. They used to shake dice for, for food. Not for money, but you could shake for your lunch, or you could shake for cigars. And that, sort of that was at the end of the cigar counter, right? That was at the end of the cigar That's counter. Right. That was a big day. <laughs> My most happy time was taking chits. They had plastic chits for fifty cents or dollar or so forth, and you could, when you won, you also would get some of those. And I went back to Chapman School one day with a pocket full of chips. <laughs> really had a lot of trouble that night at home. <laughs> I imagine. Here we have um, a newspaper ad uh, for the uh, Pullets Lon London shop, which was next door to the next storefront east uh, from your dad's place. Yeah, and that's where another connection. Max Pullets was really a character. He had a Vicuna coat in the, sitting in the window, and it said, $5 a touch. <laughs> <laughs> he was just a little too avant-garde for, for her portal. <laughs> His brother Herman was interesting. He had a, a similar clothing store near the Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles, the barber shop and manicurist, and that's where all the policemen and the gunsels came to have the sheepskin sewed into their coats so they could keep their pistolas from tearing their suits. But it didn't work for Max. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the food specials and to uh, the chef. Oh, my, my father always said that the chefs made more money than he did. And this Joe Bauer was really true. He stole him from the Benson. And he was tremendous. He did his own cutting downstairs. Uh, the lower deck, I guess, where they Shanghai sailors before they... <laughs> that became his uh, cutting edge. And so uh, his menu was very extensive. And he kept it up, named it after some of the people in the, that came in or he knew of. And he changed every day. Five days a week, he, he was cooking. And the, probably the, the biggest impact in the whole Jewish community is the neighbor's camp, after the camp closed for the last week, they have a men's camp, and my dad always brought Joe and the dishwasher down. And so at that date, the store went dead. <laughs> for a week, they could have locked up and done nothing. But it was gratifying for the amount of money that the men raised for, you know, charity, charitable campers. Yeah, that, that how long that uh, Jewish summer camp, does that still go on? Still goes on. Yeah. yeah. What time in the summer, right? Yeah, I went there. I never went to Cat Ward for a good camper, but I went for a few years. <laughs> okay, are there anything, any of these entrees? 
what about the names? I mean, they're they're making reference to Chasen's and the Palace Hotel. Yeah, uh, Joe had cooked in Los Angeles at the Ambassador, and so he also had he used to moonlight at Chasen's, and so what he was trying to do was elevate Leonard Goffman to a higher level, like, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe bring in a little more money. He was an amazing guy because he went to work like at four in the morning. And at two o'clock in the afternoon, he came upstairs in a suit and a white shirt and a tie and a fedora hat and his wife picked him up and went back to Wyoming Heights and died for the night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how about Mel Blank's Tuna and Egg Salad? Mel, of course, Mel Blank was a Portland boy. Who and remembers Mel Blank? <laughs> how many people knew he was from Portland? No. Yep. Schools. He, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the one thing that was interesting about Mel Blank, my father always said, he said, I don't know how anybody can eat a tuna and egg salad sandwich at the same time. <laughs> one or the other, but not the two together. <laughs> and Lefty O'Doul did bring the minestrone that Joe, you, he thought was better than what he had. Lefty O'Doul bought from uh, San Francisco. All right, tell folks who Lefty is and how your family knew him. Well, my, my mother went to grammar school with Lefty in San Francisco, and uh, then my mother's family moved to Portland. And the relationship was started when he played for the Dodgers. My dad did some uh, announcing and met him then when he was back east. And then he came out and managed the San Francisco Seals, and then kind of the, they found my grandma Emma, who was a great cook and lived with us, and from then on, Walter Mails and Larry Woodall and Hal Ryan and Lefty O'Doul every night planked themselves down with crawfish at our house or whenever they were in town. Yeah. Whenever they were in town for that three or four days of going. <laughs> I got but one thing is I a lot of people can't say I played catch with Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another shot of Leonard's. Um, this is actually from 1948. Uh, hasn't changed too much over the years. I, I think that's when a man fell off the roof. <laughs> that's true. He was working, washing Great. windows or something. He was washing windows. Did, did it, the exterior, the interior, did it change much over the years? It never changed a bit. Yeah. In fact, the inside didn't change any. Yeah. I don't, I, they, they didn't have to use the word improvement in those cases. <laughs> well, I think, Found what they liked and stuck with it. I think that's interesting that I mean, it wasn't a fancy looking place, it seems like. Absolutely. But it was the best food, and it was a comfortable place, and made your dad made it very welcoming for everybody. It was, and I think that the men felt safe there. They felt they could gamble safe, they could, they could stop, lots of business deals were stuck there. Lots of hollering and screaming, but it was in a safe environment, so I, th I think, yeah, it was, it was the only place they could go. I think you just struck on a really important point. Um, one of the things about not being admitted or allowed membership into the other private clubs in Portland kept Jews, Jewish professionals and businessmen from making business, having business meetings with a lot of the other uh, business people in Portland. And that was the truth, just what you said. In, 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 uh, in Leonard's, these men would come in and they'd have their own business meetings and business deals. But uh, in the broader sense, the Jews were not able to meet with the timber folks, the lumber people, the, a lot of the bankers. Can you talk to that a little bit? Well, I, I think it's, it's very true. I, I, my dad won the funny story. Remember, there was a huge one of my, they call them pan muckers. That's the men that cut the cards and said, anyway, deal with the table. But Shimmel Rosencrantz was, I think, about six foot five, and he must have weighed close to 300 pounds. And I, I can remember him more than once. Ed Sammons would be sitting at one of the counters, and Jockey Rosen, who had nothing to do with horses. <laughs> but anyway, the two of them, and Shimmel would walk up and say, where else in the world but the clear Havana House of the West can you see a pimp sitting next to a bank president? <laughs> and got away with it. And Ed Sammons laughed just as much. Uh, I, th I think that's the thing that I found the most interesting. I mean, even as, as a young kid, the 
prejudice that I found was so different from that sort of thing. I, I went to Chapman, which was a, a, it was a tough school and it was sad because half the kids there really were, if they were lucky if they got a bed. And Milton Markowitz and I talked, if they had a sandwich, it probably was just gonna be one piece of bread. And I remember the first time someone called me a Christ killer. So I went home to my mother and said, what is that? I don't know what I am. And so she explained, well, now, you know, now it's going to start. It really didn't. So I'm pretty blessed in that respect. Well, let's talk about who your dad was and, and what led him to open this place and, and to understand what this place needed to be. I, I guess I, I've got to go back to his, when he was born, he was born in 1895. And when he was seven years old, his father died. It was, his mother was the second wife. Uh, his father was 77 years old, I think, when he died. So at that time, he, his young mother didn't know what to do with these two kids. And so she put money in his pocket, and that's how he met everybody in South Portland. <laughs> he started running from the park box, and just got wider and wider and wider. Made a lot of great friends. Scotty Cohn, who used to sell papers in the corner, told me that my dad used to pay him to take the papers so he could sell them to have something to do. <laughs> Which is not a very good business deal if you think about it. So we're looking at this photo, um, and that's uh, your grandfather on the left, Correct. Isaac. Right. And uh, let's talk about him a little bit first. Well, he was primarily in the wholesale liquor business, AP Hoteling which is another conundrum of the story because when my dad was born, he sold out to AP Hoteling because he didn't want him in the liquor business, and then he ended up in the gambling business. <laughs> <laughs> but he was with AP Hoteling, and then like a lot of men, got into other businesses at that time, close by, he owned part of a drainage company. And, and it just, I guess, who should say too short a life, but doing so, uh, he exposed my father to streets, and uh, Marky Mayer, who had been a friend of my grandfather and who had spent many years in New York and was a partner of Diamond Jim Brady. So that in itself was kind of a... Uh, education. An education, <laughs> but maybe not the right kind. Not formal, no. But See, your, your grandfather uh, was much older than your dad's mother, his second wife. 48 years. I tried to do it, mine is 28 years, but I, I can't even think about that. So you're, you're, when your dad was born, your grandfather was 71, is that right? He, uh, he was 70 when my dad was born and died when my dad, he died in 77, so my dad was, uh, was seven. Yeah. There's little Leonard. Yeah, not me, that's my father. <laughs> And but then, uh, your your grandfather made quite a bit of money. He did, he did. Obviously, he did. And they, you know, then they went to Germany for a couple of years. Afterwards, she was of German extraction, and they went back to Germany for a couple of years. And my father said the only thing he can learn in, over there in two years was she kept hollering at him out the window, "Lennon, get off the track." <laughs> he was playing on the railroad tracks. <laughs> did not learn very much. Um, but the house your dad was born and spent his first several years in was on the park blocks across from uh, Lincoln High School, which is now part of PSU. Yeah, right. The where old Lincoln High School. The, the house is where the first Christian, first uh, Church of Christian Science, right. Christian Science Church. In fact, my dad spent a lot of time at Lincoln High School. My he was a senior when my mother was a freshman, and when my mother graduated, he was still a senior. <laughs> <laughs> he was doing other things. Obviously. That's a picture of my grandma Clara, my dad's mother. She was very interesting. She lived in the house of 1815 or so, or 1915, and then she began living in hotels. And in between 15 and 1945, she lived in nine hotels. She had a great time hollering and <laughs> lived well, tipped well, but hollered a lot. 
<laughs> there, I gotta stop and tell one story because I'll forget if it's anything close. But we used to go to the Portland Hotel on Sunday night for dinner. And at that time they had black waiters. And we always had the same waiter, I, th I think his name was Henry. And one time we came in for dinner and Henry gave us the outs. And another waiter waited on us and Henry stayed out to the side. And finally my dad couldn't take it any longer and, and he found him and he said, Henry, what happened? You didn't wait on us. And he started to cry and he said, I lost you in a poker game. <laughs> Um, I want to backtrack a little bit. Um, the reason I think it's important that your grandfather passed away when your dad was only seven is that it left him without a father and without that um, structure. Um, and the other thing that is important in your dad's development, I guess, and growing up is that he started out on the park blocks near Lincoln High School and he got to know all the South Portland uh, kids and remained friends with them his whole life. He did, and uh, he valued their friendship a, a great deal. Also, Marky Mayer, who was uh, New York, in New York for many, many years, and he came back to Portland, really was instrumental in, in building parts of the Columbia River Highway. He was a great influence on my dad. They say he'd been a partner of Diamond Jim Brady and he operated what they call a layoff bookie. When bookies got too big a bet and they were worried about the money or something like that, he would come in and take those bets. And so I think he started my dad in the influence of traveling. My dad visited him several times in uh, New York when they came back from Germany once. And when he was 16, he went to visit some relatives we have in Brooklyn. And then, so there was a, another, and that's when my dad started his traveling. He actually was traveling on the road at about 19, and for traveling the country. And uh, Marky Mayer, that's uh, the mayor of Fleischner Company in Portland. Fleischner Mayer. Or, yeah, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, he built the mayor building. Right. Um, and your dad really looked up to him uh, almost as a father figure, don't you think? I, he did. I, yeah. I'm sure they did. You know, that was it. Um, the one thing my dad didn't ever know, he grew up, with, his boyhood friends were Helen Ladd and Aaron Frank <laughs> and Jack Meyer, and it didn't take with my dad. <laughs> That's obvious. <laughs> so your dad um, entered, uh, during World War I, entered the service. This is up at Camp Lewis. Now Fort Lewis. This is Fort Lewis. My dad was the first non-commissioned officer, the first corporal at Fort Lewis, which he lost after about a week. He, he, he was a cook. And so if somebody would stand at the door and holler attention, my dad would come to attention and it would just be some guy kidding him. So finally, a general happened to come in, they hollered attention and my dad didn't pay any attention until he saw the star and he dropped a cigar in the soup and kept stirring. <laughs> they were never able to get any evidence, so the only thing they could do, they didn't shoot him, they just took his corporal strike. <laughs> Your dad's service uh, took him over overseas. Overseas, he was with the University of Oregon in the 364th hospital train, and they backed up the 91st Division, so they saw stretcher bearing is not fun, and so that's, that was there during the war. That's what they did. In fact, he picked Dr. Alfred Child up, who was wounded, who was a local dentist, who was a dentist when he went in and made him a second lieutenant, but then he became an infantry officer because he didn't need dentists at that time. <laughs> um, that, can I tell my funny story? Yes, go ahead. I, I have a favorite story. Uh, there's a, a attorney named Leon Berman, who was a second lieutenant, as a transport officer, bringing people back and forth to World War I and ships. And we had a cousin, Julius Neuberger, related to Senator Neuberger, who was a lieutenant commander in the Medical Corps. And the armistice was signed. They had a, uh, were having a party at the Waldorf. And I guess my dad called one of them and they said, oh, come up and bring whoever. So my dad had a cousin, 
Bernie Kaufman, who was the first sergeant in the Army uh, from Brooklyn. And so he got Bernie and a couple of other people, and he went up to the Waldorf Astoria, and the officers were so nasty to them, and you know, trying to make fun of them with the girls, that they decided enough of this. So they found the liquor was in the bathroom. They went in the, and went 20 some floors down with a case of liquor on their back, and that ended the party for the officers, and enlisted men had a really nice evening. <laughs> but the, and the next day, my dad was talking to my cousin Bernie, who he liked very much, and he said, yeah, I'd like to see you, can we get together today? And his, <laughs> our, his cousin Bernie said, well, yeah, I can. He said, I have to be in Washington, D.C. And he said, Washington, D.C.? He said, that's awful. Can't you put it off a day? He said, I don't think so. He said, well, what were you going to Washington, D.C. for? He said, well, I'm getting the Congressional Medal of Honor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so he was he was overseas with a number of uh, Portland. Another number of Portlanders. And it's yeah. really funny that my dad experienced here, they were with a lot of Jewish guys, a lot of non-Jewish, they call it the Wild West Division, so the Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana. But the number of prejudices that remained and that my dad, the rest of his life, there were two or three men in Portland who were in business my dad never talked to. He never said anything about them, but he didn't patronize their shops. And I met one of his son, and we became good friends, and I think he really realized, and we were in World War II together, that what his father, you know, what his father had done or what his father stood for. I thought that was interesting. Okay, so after your dad made it back uh, and became returned to civilian life. Um, tell us what he got involved with at that point. Well, he, then he began to travel. I, I keep using the word extensively because he was traveling the country for United Cigar, and he traveled with an awfully nice man, as I understand, by the name of Alfred Lyons. And Alfred Lyons would come out to Portland and visit, like my grandma Emma's cooking. And uh, little did we know for a long time that he was the president of Philip Morris. <laughs> my dad forgot to tell us that. <laughs> but they remained friends, and my dad built friendships up. A man named Claude Stanley, who was head of one of the Fuca Cigars. And they kept his relationship up through an uncle we had in Los Angeles who was an allergist. And he had the biggest business of anybody in the world. There's no way you can cure that. And he had a lot of relationships with people in gambling, Doc Straub of Santa Anita. And so my dad made a lot of good contacts. And that was how he really through not just Mo Annenberg, but through uh, Doc Straub that he began to do radio announcing. He did very well. He got the, a USC contact and he did the USC for quite a while until there was 1932 Aaron Rosenberg was the star defensive tackle for SC, and they were playing Notre Dame. And my dad said all he ever said was, and Rosenberg stopped him, and Rosenberg stopped him. <laughs> so at the end of the game, he announced Rosenberg 27, Notre Dame 15, and they fired him. <laughs> so this, this slide is just to show that uh, Leonard was uh, not only radio broadcasting these sports events, but also just enjoying the, the sporting life um, and, uh, and getting to know, making lots of contacts from, from uh, Agua Caliente track in um, Mexico all the way up the coast and, and certainly inland to Chicago and, and through Marky Mayer, perhaps in New York as well. Well, and then Louis Lurie in San Francisco was very influential in, uh, with, with my dad, and also with Mo Annenberg, who my dad by then was uh, associated with, with the racing forum and the Daily News. So Mo Annenberg, as Harry was saying, uh, ran the nationwide uh, race wire. Nationwide News Service. Yes. And the racing form was part of uh, his empire, really. Part of his empire. Philadelphia Inquirer. I mean, if it, was, if it was published there, he was published. And so your dad got to know 
or became associated with and came to know Mo Annenberg, um, which later when he opened his store in Portland, uh, he was able to, uh, well, it wasn't at the store though, was it? It was, uh, oh, he, he became an operator the, at the- At the mayor building. Yeah. The, the mayor building was where they operated. Mm -hmm. And then he operated at Vancouver in British Columbia. Yeah. And then Jerry O'Brien was in Los Angeles. Did Annenberg ever come to Portland that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. But down in uh, California? Yeah, California Boston. came. Yeah. He came out to the Springs every year. Okay, so you mentioned Louis Lurie before. Why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about him? Yeah, Louis Lurie was very interesting. He originated in Chicago, very interesting Jewish parents. They divorced. And here this little kid was about 10 years old, and his brother was about eight. And he was selling newspapers on the corner. And he had an uncle in Seattle. And he thought, if I can get out to Seattle, we'll have a safe place. So anyway, they rode the rails out to Seattle, couldn't find the uncle. He went back to selling papers in the corner. And he witnessed the gang killing. And he wouldn't talk to the police. He wouldn't say anything. And finally, Evidently, they, said they think underneath that whoever was part of the killing gave him some money, and he and his brother got out of Seattle and went to San Francisco and started on the way up. The, probably the best story is with uh, Giannini, when he had this Bank of Italy, he would sit in the front of the bank. If you came in and wanted to borrow money, you came up to Mr. Giannini. So Mr. Lurie walked in and he wanted to borrow $2,500. At that time, it wasn't Mr. Lurie, I guess he was about a 12-year-old kid, <laughs> to, uh, he wanted to buy a printing company. And Mr. G Mr. Giannini said to him, where's your colada? He said, colada? And he said, yeah, what are you going to get me to hold for you? So Lurie, well, went, on, yeah. Lurie went outside, and there was a banana wagon, cart. And so he bought the whole bunch of bananas, took them in, threw them on his desk and said, how's this for collecting? <laughs> and he and he laughed and that's what started him off. And he ended up owning the Mark Hopkins, the Sir Francis Drake, the American Bank building in Chicago, one time the Santa Barbara Biltmore. Yeah, you gotta tell the Biltmore, Santa Barbara story. Yeah, this, this is with your this parents. This is really a funny story. My parents were with them traveling and they went to, got the Santa Barbara Biltmore and he had a shirt as many people wore in those days with a stud but no collar. And the major day when they went in the hotel, they had checked in the hotel. When he went to the dining room, the major day said, you can't come in without a tie. <coughs> and he said, well, don't you have a tie I can wear? And he said, no, you don't have that. And so anyway, they went to the Miramar, checked out. But he said to man, he said, I'd look for a job if I were you. Next day, he bought the Santa Barbara Biltmore and fired him. <laughs> <laughs> the guy had no idea who, no, who he was talking to. Yeah. Well, but really, that's kind of a lesson in life. You should always, you never know who it is that you're going to be talking to. The, you know, a knock is a boost, no matter what you do. Um, but as you're seeing, as we go through these slides and, and, and talking about these different people, Marky Mayer and Louis Lurie, these are people who are powerful people and have a lot of contacts. And uh, your parents were good friends with the Luries. Uh, well, my mother grew up with Babette to Mrs. Lurie. And uh, I, I think there is a thing that we talk about Jewishness or not being in places, but the disadvantage to a a Jewish kid or somebody coming up who can't be at a golf club or can't be in this group that's, whether it's with Mohon Club or the Arlington Club or whatever it was, what a disadvantage it was. That's hopefully. I, the, another Jewishness story, I guess, is Harry Middleman, who was the largest stockholder of a U.S. bank and they wouldn't put him on the board. And that was a big contention. I remember that for years in Portland. Yeah. Phil Lilienthal. Phil Lilienthal and his wife were friends with my dad. There, that was Levi Strauss. From San Francisco. The Hazes from San Francisco. Just another 
they had they had an interesting thing happen. They one went to Stanford and one went to Cal. And when they went to a football game, they each sat on the other side of the stadium. <laughs> kind of a lonesome day. Okay, on to uh, Marky Mayer. We've talked about him already. Um, but I, I think you can't overstate how important he was for your father. Oh, no, he, he was very important. I mean, he was, a, he was the only instructor he had during that time, for good or bad. And he made a good fisherman out of him. He was, he was good. Um, so here's opening day at uh, Leonard's 1930 uh, with Arthur Leonard and Leonard Kaufman. Um, and here is uh, a great shot of your dad outside of Leonard's with a good friend of his. Uh, yeah, that's the Earl Goodwin, who was uh, Governor Martin's secretary, and uh, he called him the little sergeant. But he he was in World War One with my father too, but never made it overseas for some reason. And here's another uh, great shot of your dad surrounded by uh, racing and race wire uh, folks. And, and, he, and, and Jack Dempsey. And Jack Dempsey, right yeah. above his shoulder there. Yeah, he was kind of. They sent him around. He was the PR guy for the nationwide news. You want to talk about the little character there? Ugly little thing. <laughs> <laughs> Leonard and his, uh, and his dad. We were thinking that's probably uh, Jansen Beach, maybe? That's right. That's where the only thing I can think of. Yeah. Years that early thirties. Uh, oh yeah, I think very, very, very early thirties. Uh, your uncle Louis, you want to? Well, this was another connection, I guess, to my father. My uncle Louis. In fact, the, the Camas Washington Louis Block Park is named after him. He started as a millwright, Camas. Worked his way down to San Francisco, never left the office, and he became chairman of the board of Crown Zollerback. And my most interesting story, though, was, was with the, all, we all know the Bank of California. And it wasn't until he died that they had drive-in banking. He wasn't going to have anything changes made. <laughs> so he was a little bit behind his time. And this just illustrate, further illustrates the connection between the Lurie family and the Kaufmans. You want to talk well, about this the, trip? The most one is my mother laughed. I don't know if you can read it, but in time it says just the Yokel paper. My mother couldn't get over it that they referred to the Lurie's as Portlanders instead of San Francisco. <laughs> but, but the story is that you're, you're going overseas with the Lurie family to China, right? Yeah, I did. On uh, a trip. Yeah, yeah, they took me on a trip. I was, I, was, I was not a paying customer. <laughs> I'd have been in St. Helens or someplace. Yeah. So now, uh, a look at some of the people who would frequent uh, your dad's place. Uh, as Harry talked about earlier, Gus Solomon um, would come in fairly uh, frequently. Oh, well, Gus Solomon came in schmooze. Yeah. Not, he didn't play card, but he came in, he was one of the one sat around and needled each other. My father referred to his place as the needling capital of the world. Uh, how about this character? Well, yeah, I, I was I was about seven or eight when Ralph Capone came down. He got out of uh, McNeil Island, and there was some foul up. I don't know what happened, but anyway, his money didn't come or anything else. So he called my dad and referred to him as friend Kaufman. So my dad got Joe Birnbaum from Green Cigar Store. To, I don't know if they drove him down or took the train, but anyway, he came to Portland, ensconced at the Benson until he got straightened out, and uh, came up to dinner, and my grandmother referred to him as Mr. Capone. <laughs> and he liked your, your grandma's he liked cooking. My grandma's co he liked my grandma's cooking, kidded her that she could make it back east if she wanted to go. And the next day he was gone. But the, the crux of the story that I always hate myself for 
he wrote my dad a note, which I had for a long time and then lost, in which he said, Friend Kaufman, I can't thank you enough for taking care of me during this trying time. If you ever need anything, just call me and I'll send somebody out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you, you all should be aware that Ralph Capone is, or was Al's brother uh, from Chicago. Cicero. Yes. Cicero. Yes, yeah, sorry. Cicero. <laughs> Um, so here's an example of uh, uh, one of the uh, business uh, deals that uh, your dad got involved with, um, with some other folks. Couriers are very interesting. They had some idea that they were going to uh, get a gambling spot. It's down in southern Oregon, out in the middle of nowhere. If you if you pick this spot in the middle of the Mojave Desert, it would be about what the Courier's Village was. It was a lake. There were fish popping up in it and frogs. The food was cheap. But nobody's going to get in a car from California and drive up there. Nobody's going to get in a car from Seattle. So it was, uh, it was kind of, my father had a couple of, really great business deals. He had a $10,000 tie. You don't know of many people that had that. But a man came up from Los Angeles who had a timber rights. And my father talked a bunch of other people into getting into the timber rights, which of course didn't prove wrong. Not, they were timber wrongs, not timber rights. And of course, my father had to pay everybody off. So what he ended up with was a painted necktie that the man had brought and given to my dad. <laughs> which didn't match anything he wore, anyway. Where would Courier's Village be today? Courier's Village is actually uh, near Coos Bay. Uh, Lakes, it used to be, is there still a place called Lakes, Lakeside? Yeah. Yeah, so it was right there, and uh, Courier, I think his name was Roy Courier, was from Los Angeles, and he got investors from Reno, including the honchos there, head honchos in Reno, like Bill Graham, um, and uh, Bones Remmer, really uh, the folks who opened the Cal Neva, um, what, and Lake Tahoe, pardon? Era, was he involved in that? No, not at that point. Um, so, uh, Leonard's dad, uh, was one of the investors, and Leonard remembers going down there for the opening day in 1936, um, for when they opened this place. And it, it was built as a resort, and they built an airstrip because, as Leonard said, it was in the middle of nowhere. Um, so a lot of people were flying up from Los Angeles or down from Seattle or yeah. from Portland. Um, and uh, it it didn't make a lot of money except for the gambling concession, <laughs> which is why uh, Leonard's dad got involved with it um, in the first place. So um, we're going to move on to this story uh, when Leonard comes back to talk about uh, the Bund, the German Bund, and uh, and its impact uh, and uh, how it affected uh, the, the people who gathered at Leonard's. And there was a really direct impact and a direct response as well. Um, Is this a good time to talk about Al Winter? Like, yeah, uh, we could talk about Al Winter. Um, he was actually, Al Winter was um, kind of the, the crime boss in Portland, and he was involved in the courier, um, the courier investment, the courier resort uh, on, at Coos Bay as well. Um, and he... Uh, He had made many ties through Leonard and all the contacts he made, uh, such as L Louis Lurie, Marky Mayer, all these guys helped uh, Al Winter, who was from Portland, 
um, to connect with other people to to um, to to funnel their money into projects he wanted to do, and more importantly, to meet other people and meet other um, people who would be willing to associate with him. And uh, by the time uh, the late 40s came around, Al Winter uh, had made so much money in the Portland area, the Oregon area, the Northwest in general, uh, with uh, gambling and other investments. So when reform came in in the late 40s in Portland, he just picked up his operations and moved down to Vegas where everything was legal. And that's where, uh, with fellow associates, including uh, Dell Webb, Dell Webb Construction Company had just finished building the Flamingo for Bugsy Siegel, and uh, Al Winter partnered with Dell Webb's president, Dell Webb Construction Company. Their president was Elsie Jacobson, and uh, they built and invested in Al's hotel which and casino, which was the, the Sahara. And That's Solomon and uh, Ray Cow were his lawyers in Portland. That is right. Uh, Gus Solomon was helping Al, especially during this same period in the late 40s, figure out how he could protect all of his investments and his uh, gambling activities. And Ray, Ray Cal, who was the power of the Democratic Party. That's right. Who became uh, uh, Terry Shrunk's uh, basically campaign uh, manager. And advisor. Here's the guy behind Shrunk. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, if I wanted to find out where Leonard's place is physically, what's there today? It is the building is no longer there. Sadly, uh, it's I, I don't. It's Sixth and Oak. I mean, it's between Sixth and Broadway uh, on the north, north side of Oak. Six seventeen. Yeah. North yeah, but there's a a big big building that I think occupies the whole block now. Yeah. Um. So we're going to move into just the discussion of uh, the German Bund and uh, what was the response from um, from the folks at, that would uh, gather at Leonard's. And I, I wanted to point out that uh, the meeting hall for the, the local Bund was just four blocks away from Leonard's um, uh, further north on 6th. So it was a, in close proximity. Uh, as well. I think it was across Burnside. Yes, it was. Yeah. The, uh, I, I remember first seeing the Bund when our Sunday school was up on 13th and the term, German Turnbrian was across the street and they used to parade every day which is <laughs> was really scary to all of us that were young kids. And then our father started standing, would stay there during the uh, services for those couple of hours and uh, wait with us there rather than dump us off and go downtown to dad's or something or anywhere they would stay. But they were very, uh, very vocal. There were a lot of kids and a lot of uniforms waving. And it, it was scary, especially when you figure you're, I'm in, I'm in America and now this is happening here. Um, and uh was there a response from the, uh, or, or how were the people, the men who were gathering at, at uh, Leonard's? Well, I, I think the, the first response, they, they wrote letters to the newspaper, and the American Legion and the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and, and there was a, you know, a lot of response to that. But of course, see, we're talking about what, two or three or four, or 500 people is hard to, simulated any kind of action against them, but Fritz Kuhn, who was the minor brewer or whatever they call him of, of the American Brewer and send an organizer. Yeah, he was the national, uh, he was the national leader of the national, national brewer or whatever they call him. Yeah. He, he sent a uh, organizer to Portland. They were going to have a huge meeting at the Portland Stockyards and this is just what I can surmise is that 
the Jewish community, some of the men got worried. And I can remember and <laughs> talk about with any sense is that they met at my dad's Sunday night. They always closed my dad's store a little early anyway so the men could get home. And most of the men had to be home anyway. But I mean the men that worked there. But on this particular night, my dad took me down and I made the sandwiches. I was probably about, maybe I was eight years old or nine years old. And the men met in the back and then they also went down the basement. And I never knew what they went down the basement. But the only outcrop that was kind of nice was that whoever the organizer was disappeared. They never did find him. And the one really, other than their vocal messages, never got any farther. So, you know, that's kind of left up to your imagination. It's like the UFO story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the spacecraft came down and got him. Was there any connection between them and the KKK at that time? Was the KKK much of a presence? In, in rural, I think more rural than in the town. Uh -huh. but, but you know, that, that, that's a really good question. Yeah, they, because they, they were power in the early 20s exactly. in Oregon, yeah, control exactly. the legislature and so forth. But uh, they had trouble here as well as other parts of the country. It was a money making operation in part, and they'd split over stealing in it and so forth. And uh, But they were. Uh, they were a great power. Uh, they were around, the Klan was around in the 30s too. Uh, Ab they were absolutely around, but I mean, they, they, they were, what I really saw, heard or read and things I read later is they were very rural. People yeah. were scared in the 30s. That's right. By the economy, you know, people were scared. And uh, people got blamed, you know. Sometimes the Jews got blamed. Uh, being bankers or being communists? Yeah. Or well, the famous Jewish banker communists. Right. Uh, Un-American. Uh, yeah, there were, uh, but there was also organizing against, there were espionage files, there were private, there were people sent into these fascist groups and at the OHS their, their files of these, of these agents reporting on the fascist groups. It's hard to know what came of it. Uh, but that they were infiltrated uh, anyway and there was active organizing in the Jewish community uh, partly because mainly because of Hitler and the Nazis uh, and there were uh, many organizations formed to uh, defense basically defense organizations and and I suspect in a lot of cities in the east on the east coast there were there were uh, fights in Boston between uh, groups out it with baseball bats and so forth. Portland didn't have it. Yeah. Didn't have. Didn't have that. The social conflict is always in Portland. It's just muted. Right. I, I think another. We don't thing talk you, about it, but it's there. I think another thing you said is interesting about the KKK. Uh, there was so much segregation between black and white in Portland. I mean, Williams Avenue was really a definition. Yeah. And I think that's where, uh, I, where I heard a KKK was more St. John's and uh, mm. down in Slab Town by uh, Monkey Wards and that sort of thing where you had ethnic groups that were really right. severe in trouble. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to move ahead a, a little bit so we can get to some questions. Um, Lefty O'Doul, we talked about Lefty, and uh, we didn't say that he opened a real popular club down in San Francisco. Oh no, Lefty O'Doul's been popular for years and years. And well, he probably, he was Mr. San Francisco. Yeah. At least, the restaurant's still going. Too. Yeah, the club's oh, still, yeah. yeah, right. Here's a great shot of uh, Lefty when he the, became the new manager of the San Francisco Se Seals with his star player, uh, Joe DiMaggio, and both of them would come up to your place, to, wouldn't they? When Joe was with the Seals. Yeah, yeah. and they play at Old Bond Street Park, um, and then come for dinner at your place. Crawfish, crawfish. <laughs> Use the mic, uh, Larry. I'm sorry, they came for crawfish. Is that off? Sorry. There. Probably, probably somebody turned it off on purpose. Yeah. It, uh, 
Anyway, they came for crawfish. That was the big ball player thing in the Jake's crawfish. Oh, sure, yeah. Okay, so real quick, uh, some other people who would come to Portland and come to your dad's store. Here's um, Supreme Court Justice William Bill Douglas. Bill Douglas came. The, the most embarrassing thing for my mother was my dad called her one day, and it was during the Jewish holidays, and he said, be the nicest man came in the store to eat lunch. And he asked me where the temple was. He said, I'm going to bring him home for dinner tonight. Is it okay? So my mother said, well, who, you know, what does he do? She said, I don't know. Anyway, my mother opened the door. It was Melvin Douglas who was doing a stage play in Portland. <laughs> I'm sure my dad caught it for that. Uh, here's uh, Al Winter, and you mentioned uh, Milt Hyatt earlier, who worked for your dad. And he was the one who, uh, when he got out of the service, he s was suddenly uh, the uh, benefactor of $600,000 and a new partner in Al's business. And they're standing in front of the flamingo that was just uh, down in Vegas that had just recently been completed. Um, and of course, these are friends and associates of, of Leonard's dad. Another one. Uh, Artie Samish out of California would come up to Portland for business uh, and uh, would come into your dad's store. Yeah, Artie Samish, was the, he was the fixer. If you wanted something in the Sacramento legislature, that's he went to. I guess now they call him lobbyist, but in his day he was the number one lobbyist fixer in California. He wanted your son kissed oranges, which is a great story on Rabbi Fain who was the little orthodox rabbi that when I grew up as a kid, he had a flaming red beard. And my, a friend of my uncle's called, who had a prune orchard. And he said, I need to get prunes kosher because I'm shipping them to Chicago, but Rabbi Fain is gonna charge me two cents a bucket or whatever it was, how he shipped the prunes. And he said, I don't think I can pay that much. And he, my dad said, well, maybe I can find somebody in Seattle. So he called Rabbi Koch in Seattle and said, you know, what you can do it. Can you do it any cheaper? He said, no, it's Rabbi Fain's territory. <laughs> <laughs> Another um, periodic visitor to um, Leonard's store, uh, the mob boss from Los Angeles, Mickey Cohen, who would come to Portland every once in a while. And who nobody liked. Yeah. They always wanted my dad to poison the pastrami when he came. <laughs> uh, and your dad did get um, invited to come work for a casino uh, down in Palm Desert. Yeah, my, my dad, the one ability he had, he got along with everybody. If he didn't like you, then you fell off his radar and he just didn't think about you anymore. He didn't, he didn't say anything bad about you, he just disappeared. And he was able, he just had a wonderful ability to get along with anybody. Uh, Harry James and Betty Grable were two of the hardest people in the United States to deal with in gambling. And my dad was able to placate them to the point that the 139 Club in Cathedral City near Palm Springs, which of course was an illegal club, the only purpose of my dad being there was to keep the movie people happy. He did, but my mother wasn't happy with Palm Springs, and I don't think my father really liked it either, so that was not a very good, uh, but I did learn something about cheating at gambling. <laughs> Pope and Talbot is a huge steamship company, and Bill Talbot was a good, fairly good friend of mine, and he got into something with one of the dealers at the 139 Club, and so they were playing back and forth. And the dealer, I think, went out to the desert for his reward. And Bill Talbot got the scare of his life. And those people are not people to fool with. <laughs> uh, that reminds me, I think it's important to talk about um, the Meyer, Meyer and Frank uh, strike with the Teamsters and, and uh, your dad's role. Yeah, that's probably something I'm more proud of than anything else with my more dad. I, I, it would be about 35, 36? 33, I think 33. Oh, a little earlier? Yeah, yeah, I think about 33. I, I can't tell you when, but anyway, they're, they're, I can remember as a kid when the Myron Frank trucks would come up and they had the wooden stake sides on the side, they had a guy running shotgun. 
With a rifle. With, with a shotgun. Yes. With a shotgun. And uh, it really got tough. They had some drivers pulled off and everything. And Aaron Frank came to my dad because he knew that there were people in the team series that my dad had been in World War One with that trusted him. And he knew that my dad read if his word was his bond. And anyway, my dad, my dad, and I can't tell you where he did it with corned beef and cabbage or, or what he did it. But anyway, he got them together, and they they finally settled the strike. And uh, that was probably the biggest thing that I ever thought that my dad was really huge to me because uh, there were there were a lot of people who were hurt and a lot of people more could have been hurt. How he did it or what he did, I don't know. But he that was just his. He had that innate ability. I guess they call him a facilitator now. Yeah. That's certainly a tough position to be put into. Uh, I know from doing some research on the Teamsters strike of uh, breweries, there were people who ended up dead uh, in those confrontations. Shot. That's what my father said. The only good thing about it, he wasn't worried because his name had been mentioned with Aaron Frank. If they killed him, it probably would have killed Aaron Frank, too, so he'd have been in good company. So here's a great shot of Leonard and his dad. Um, you're just back from the service? Just back, yeah, just back from the service. And uh, this is towards the end of your dad's life? Well, this is in 1945. Okay, so it's so still... He's got, so he's still there. <coughs> Um, Where were you stationed? I was with the First Marine Division. So, towards the end of the 40s, uh, your dad uh, took ill. Is that right? And then... Um, well, he, uh, he took ill in 49. Okay. So he had those, you know, those four or five years uh, after, you know, after World War II. In, in fact, one funny story, I came back from the service and I said to my dad, you're in the restaurant business, what's a 7WD restaurant? He said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, well, I, guys in the service tell me when you're in New York, the greatest restaurants are 7WD, it must be a chain of some kind. And so we were sitting, my dad always had a cigar, and all of a sudden he looked at me and he started to laugh. And I said, what's so funny? He said, that's a kosher sign outside of Delhi. <laughs> Seven WD. Um, so that, that was another thing too. I, I think it's important for Jewish people to know. In the community, the women especially, my mother and her friends, really had their own little circle. The men in these being able to go to a club and stuff were able to do these things. But when my mother was in mixed company and she wanted to talk about somebody or didn't know she would turn Jew backwards and it would say wedge. <laughs> so she would want to know if somebody was a wedge. <laughs> Much more than MOT, I thought that was really funny. Never, we always used to talk about wedges. Wedges. Um, the other important thing happening in Portland in the late 40s that your dad uh, played a part in was Dorothy McCullough Lee coming in with a reform movement. She was the Portland's first woman mayor and definitely was trying to bring about uh, change and reform. Well, she really did, and my dad got upset because the card rooms had been licensed for years. Erickson's and O'Connor's and uh, Kelly's, Olympian. And so what happened is here are these working men's places where working men could go to play cards. You st still couldn't get into uh, the Multnomah Club, or they couldn't afford to get into the Multnomah Club, and my dad thought it was unfair. So he went to Dorothy McCauley, who had no idea about the licensing of anything, and he explained to her, and he explained it to her this way, he said, look, the only thing that's illegitimate is when you don't have a piece of the action. So if it's a licensed card room, we're not playing against the people that come in there, we're not bringing shills in, it's people that sit down and can't afford to be in the office. She understood that. She stopped all the rest of gambling and bookmaking and everything else. She went after it, but she left the licensed card rooms, and there's still licensed card rooms today. So. Are we going to go to the store jokes, or do you want to let it go? No, what? Store. Are we going to go to the stores? Yeah, yeah. In the end? Yeah. The, uh, before I leave you, I, two or three 
funny things, and maybe this really sets what my dad was. He had a fellow named Benny, who had he'd known in South Portland, grown up with him. Benny was one of the card makers. And they were having some losses, and it finally came down that it was Benny. And so the manager, dad, said, well, should I call the police? And my dad said, of course not. He only stole on good days. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a restaurant across the street called Shelley's. And my, I'll, I'll tell two quick stories and shut up. My uh, dad was losing money out of the till. And he knew it wasn't Harry White or wasn't the men that were behind the counter, but he couldn't figure it out. So my uncle got a Pinkerton and they watched the store, of course, unbeknownst to my dad, and the Pinkerton report came back and said, the only man taking money is a heavy set man with a cigar in his mouth who gets money out of the till and then gives it to people so they can eat lunch. <laughs> my dad didn't want anybody to come in the store and, who needed a meal and feel like he was gonna be on the dole. So he did this one day to a guy who thanked my dad and went across to Shelley's and ate. <laughs> <laughs> Which my dad thought was hysterical. <laughs> um, and I think that's a really important thing. I mean, those kind of, um, uh, that kind of generosity from your dad and his personality and the way he uh, was so welcoming to everybody. After your dad passed away in 1950, the business was sold to someone else who who didn't have those qualities. Okay, it went, it went down faster than a parachute. Yeah, it was gone. And I think, I mean, that's a testament to your dad and what he was able to do with that place and, and uh, uh, you know, maintain uh, the attraction and the appeal for all those people who did want to come, that once he wasn't part of it anymore. No one else could do it the way he had. So in closing, we're gonna show a couple shots of uh, Leonard's family and uh, where they went to recently. Here's a shot of his family from a couple years ago. About three years ago, going to web. Yeah. And then just about a month ago, Leonard goes to the Multnomah Athletic Club. My, my grandson is a scholar athlete, and so he's the member, which we've always laughed about because when I was married the first time, my wife was a member, and because they weren't take, they had a Jewish quota then, she had to resign. Which I, if I'd been her, I'd have taken the membership and told me goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. That's the end of this program. Much. <laughs> but uh, Leonard and Harry are both uh, willing to take questions from anyone who has some. It's where the sauce gonna, box is now. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, man. Yes. It's, it, I love that place. I don't know, I'm getting to the age where yeah. you know, things come and go. You know? There's a question over it there. It was Shelley. a great yeah. place when, with the steam table and the little mezzanine up there. Uh, it's a great place. Social clubs dropped their anti-Semitic and anti uh Minority stances. Uh, in the seventies, uh, uh, <clears throat> major leadership came from Gus Solomon as a federal judge. Uh, he broke open the uh, law firms to hire Jews, uh, and the uh, and the downtown uh, downtown clubs. In the seventies. Uh, yeah, I and have. Motonkin went to Waverly. That's. Right. Motonkin was usually the first uh, in places. Uh, first Jew. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there were there were people in the there were people in these clubs who either didn't know of the long term anti-Semitic policy or didn't care, but there were others who did. And uh, uh, there was pressure put on them, organized pressure put on them. Thank you. Oh, you're not in the way. Yeah, I'm just gonna for a loser. Another question? Yes, sir. Do you have a question? Uh, I'm from San Francisco, uh, actually down the peninsula. 
I went to Menlo with Bob. Oh, you did? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No yeah, Bob here. Yeah, I know Bob. He's a, a great guy. Uh, are there any recordings of your dad doing any uh, athletic events? No, I tried to find some. Huh. I, uh, I tried to get that Notre Dame <laughs> SC one. I wasn't able to. Then he had another set, but one recording that I had, and something happened to it. There was a, a Jewish <coughs> athlete named uh, Dave Schmuckler. Name is bad enough. Played for Temple, and he played for Pop Warner. Wow. And when he went to Temple the first year, they uh, Pop Warner took him to the room. He said, "I got you a place to live in one of the fraternity houses." So he took his little bag and went over there. And he was a bruiser of a guy, kind of like about your size. And he, uh, sorry. Anyway, uh, Dave Schmuckler went over to the house, and the president of the house took him aside and said, "Look." We don't take Jews, and we're going to allow you to live here, but you can't tell anybody. So he said, okay. So he went back to pop to practice the next day, and then he said to Pop Warner, look, we have to work something out. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, I want the fraternity house to take $200 every month, and that was a lot of money in those days, and I want it to go to the little synagogue downtown. If the month, they don't get the check, I don't play. So Prop Warner, through his buddy Charlie Winterburn, who was his quarterback coach, he went to the fraternity and said, well, get it up, buddy, or, this, or we won't have a team this year. So for the next three years when he was playing there, 200 bucks a month went to a little synagogue. <laughs> I direct your uh, attention, sir, to tell me how Duncan's retreat fit into your scene. Duncan's retreat. Oh, well, when my uh, dad passed away, or dad was ill, a man named Leo Giroff bought my dad's. And he was, people referred to him as the mad Russian. And he probably had a lot of good qualities, but they weren't dealing with people. And he was avaricious, not just in money, but in, also in how he dealt with food and everything else. And in a matter of probably a couple of months, he insulted most of the people that came to dad. One was Al Winters, who my dad kept a phone for. And every day, Al Winters put a hundred dollar bill on the counter. And that was for the phones or whatever he did, which was a lot of money. And so Al Winters just moved over to the Benson. And that was, uh, then they started Duncan's as an answer place that he could hang his hat when he came back to Portland, it would have been at Leonard's if it hadn't meaning been. Meaning Al Winters. Yeah, meaning Al Winters. Yeah. So that's how Duncan's was started. It was Al Winters that started Duncan. Not Ted Duncan was like the front man. Does that answer the, your question? Yeah. Because I saw Al Winters at Duncan's in the early years. Yeah. And, uh, if I'm remembering right, I think I am, that Duncan's opened in 1954. Uh, Leonard's dad passed away in 1950, and Jeroff took over. You need the mic. Soon after that. Um, you know, this is, not, this is stuff that is usually not talked about or written about, which you're hearing tonight. Um, uh, the sporting life, the gangs, and so forth. There's, uh, there's, there's stuff on the organized Jewish gangs in the East, but what you're hearing tonight is how, how things were operating in a lot of cities. And uh, yeah, the interesting part of that, is this on? Yeah, the interesting point with Al Winter is he, he was not Jewish himself. Um, but he is such a local judge. He, yeah, he, he Re graduate. He was, most of his associates were uh, Jewish, and he was, uh, you know, a constant, whenever he was in Portland, he was a constant, uh, uh, constantly at your dad's place. 
So Duncan's opened in 54, and so there was that four-year period where I asked Leonard, you know, where, where once uh, your father died and the store was sold to Jeroff, where did everyone go? And uh, how did you answer that? Well, what I found by then, people were assimilating more. Uh, they weren't in the Arlington Club, they weren't in the others, but a lot of men had made money during the war, so that was a certain percentage who were no longer, you know, needed letters, yeah. had other businesses and things like that. And what Al Winters was trying to develop had nothing to do with my dad's, where it was a, he was he was trying to open another gambling place, you know, set up a gambling empire again. Duncan's. Duncan's. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that was the difference. You know, maybe my dad's time had outlived itself. You know, they were on to other things, there'd been another war. Whatever the reason is, nothing was nothing was the same, or nothing stays the same. Right. Any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>